is the Unit 2 AP Macroeconomics Review. We're going to start with one of the most important concepts in macroeconomics, GDP or gross domestic product. This is something they test in the free response and the multiple choice all the time, so you need to understand all the components and how it affects the economy. So the definition of GDP is really good. It's very all-encompassing, so let's go over it. GDP is the dollar value of all final goods and services produced within the United States in a given year. So what I mean by all of those different components, the dollar value, GDP is always in dollars, that's why you see it in like the trillions, of all final goods, and that's key because only the finished product that sells counts in GDP. So what's excluded from GDP are intermediate goods. These are resources, what is used to make the finished product. It's assumed that when you think of steel in a car, the steel will be included in the price of the car that is sold. So resources, also known as intermediate goods, do not count in GDP. So of all final goods, produced is the most important word. This means the year it was made. Does not matter when it sells. We only care about the year it was produced. So a 2014 never been used iPhone sold in 2017 counted in 2014's GDP, not 2017's GDP. Within a given year goes with the same thing. And then within a country, what I mean by this, it has to be made in the United States to count in the United States GDP. So a Japanese car company producing a Honda in Ohio counts in our GDP, not Japan's, which also means if we outsource our production to another country, it counts in their GDP, not ours. So it doesn't matter who makes it, it matters where it's produced. There's another way of calculating growth called GNP, gross national product. Um, we use this one to measure our economy, but GNP looks at American companies producing goods no matter where they produce it. So that looks at those foreign, um, foreign produced American companies. So with this, the things that do count in GDP can either be in the expenditure approach or the income approach, which we covered in the circular flow model. Remember, the expenditure approach looks at goods and services. The factor approach measures GDP through the income approach, which is all of the different incomes added up together. So the wages for the labor, the rent for the land, the interest on the capital, and the profit for the entrepreneurs, RIP. Those are the four types of incomes calculated in the income approach. But we mostly use the expenditure approach on the AP macro exam. And in fact, because they're both in the circular flow model, they end up equaling the same number, so you only really do have to calculate one or the other. So here are the components of the expenditure approach. Consumption. Now consumption is really important because consumption is the largest component of GDP. It makes up like two thirds or 67% of all GDP. So that's why to some, this is the most important component, namely the government. This is the one they focus on, focus on changing to fix a recession or inflation. Two other things to note, it is just dealing with goods and services produced, but also two things that count under consumption, paying rent and your income. Now don't mix up income just because it starts with an I and put it in here. I think of it as the consumer's income that helps remind me that it fits under C, not I. Now I stands for gross private investment. So we're looking at investment within GDP, but don't be misled. Stocks, bonds, and loans, the things that are part of the financial market and purely dealing with money and not goods and services, do not count directly into GDP. So that is not what I mean by investment. There are three things that do count though as investment in GDP. A new home produced that year, inventory. So my iPhone example of the iPhone that is made in 2014 but doesn't sell until 2017, it counted in 2014's GDP as inventory. So if it's made but doesn't produce, it counts under investment. If the iPhone was produced in 2014 and also sold in 2014, it would count under consumption. So either way, it counts in the year it was produced. And then finally, physical capital. Physical capital, um, new factories or machinery counts as investment. So those are the only three things that count as investment. And take note that all of these things are from the perspective of the borrower, not the lender. GDP is from the perspective of the borrower. And this component is also the most important component to some people, namely classical economists, because this is the component that always has the direct relationship with long run economic growth. If investment goes up, long run growth goes up. If investment goes down, long run growth goes down. So that's why classical economists who believe in the long run want you to focus on this.
G stands for government, and government's pretty easy, but you need to take note that it only counts when the government's receiving a good or service in return. Government handouts, also known as entitlement programs and transfer payments, do not count in GDP at all. And then finally, net exports. Net exports is talking about exports minus imports. So don't be misled that imports is in the equation we should say yes is included. I like to think of it as imports not only don't count from GDP, they actually subtract from GDP. So if we buy a car from Japan, produced in Japan, it takes money out of our GDP and puts it into theirs. So not only do foreign goods not count in GDP, they actually subtract from it. So if we import more than we export, this component of GDP can actually be negative. And US usually has a trade deficit, so this component of ours is usually negative. So those are the things that count, and I've gone over some of the ones that don't count, but to finish it out, non-market goods are goods that are not reported as income to the government. So babysitting and you don't pay taxes on it, or volunteering and there's no dollar value on it. Anything old and used also doesn't count. It has to be in the year it was made, and it can only count once, so if it's reused, it doesn't count in GDP. And those are all the things that count in GDP. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about goes with the PPC graph, and it's to illustrate this thing called the GDP gap. The GDP gap, when looking at the production possibilities curve, illustrates a point, so let's say this is capital goods and consumer goods, it illustrates a point from where you would be in long-run equilibrium to where you are in a recession, and we covered that in unit one. So the distance between those two points is the GDP gap. And if we are at long-run equilibrium, this would be known as you've met your potential GDP. So this is where we wanna be at our potential, and if we're in a recession, we have a GDP gap. And this thing called Ocon's Law measures that GDP gap. Ocon's Law states that for every 1% increase in unemployment, there's a 2% decrease in GDP. So it measures how much of an impact an increase in unemployment can have on overall GDP, and that means overall health of the economy. So that's Ocon's Law and the GDP gap. The next thing with GDP, because there's a lot with GDP, is nominal versus real GDP. Nominal GDP measures GDP using current prices. So the keyword for nominal is current prices. This is unadjusted for inflation. For example, if I was calculating nominal GDP and if in 2014, 10 iPhones were sold for $4,000 total, and in 2015, four iPhones were sold for $40,000 total, it would look like GDP went up because nominal GDP went up. But in reality, the same amount of iPhones were produced each year. So it's unadjusted for inflation because you don't know when nominal GDP goes up if more was produced or if it was just inflation or if both. So it's not really as accurate as the other one that we use, real GDP. Real GDP adjusts for inflation by setting a constant price, a constant price. So it would just say an iPhone is always worth $400. So that way we can actually measure by setting that constant price every single year how many iPhones were produced. Now this is where we get into some of the formulas. With this, sometimes we have to figure out what real GDP is. And to do this, to find out the formula for real GDP, you would have to know what the nominal GDP is over this thing called the GDP deflator. The GDP deflator is a price index that measures inflation within GDP, how much inflation there was within GDP, and then times this by 100. So this would adjust the nominal, take out the inflation, and give you the real GDP. Or sometimes it'll have you solve for the GDP deflator, it wants you to answer how much inflation was there within GDP, and that would again be nominal GDP on the top over now real GDP, times by 100. And that's how you could either solve for real GDP, adjust it for inflation, or solve for the inflation within GDP. And speaking of inflation, that gets us going on our next topic, our other way we measure inflation called CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index. The Consumer Price Index is measuring inflation looking at a market basket of goods. Okay, so what I mean by the market basket is they take a, they look, take a look at the typical urban family and what type of goods that those family members buy on a daily basis. 
clothing, education, transportation, housing, and it sets a fixed quantity, a fixed market basket of those goods. Then you can compare the prices from year to year. So let's say the base year is 1982, because that's when they roughly set our market basket, and all the goods and services in the market basket added together equals $20,000. Then, in 2017, they looked at the same market basket of goods and services, and it was equal to $60,000. So this is the value of the market basket. So we can use these market basket values to calculate CPI. And the formula for CPI is the current year market basket over the base year's market basket times by 100. And I told you the base year was 1982, so that'll be our base year value. So if I were to calculate the CPI for the base year, 1982, it would be $20,000, because the current year and the base year are the same, over $20,000 times by 100. And that's why no matter what numbers you plug in for the base year CPI, it's always gonna equal 100. So the base year is always equal to the number 100. Now, you don't have to label this, it's not a dollar value or a percentage, it's just a number to represent CPI. Then I could also find the CPI for 2017. Now the current year would be 60,000, because that's 2017's market basket. The base year is still 20,000 times by 100, my CPI for 2017 would be 300. So this is the values of the CPIs for those two years. And then the final thing I would do is calculate the percentage change in inflation there was between the two years. And the formula for this would be Y2, year two, the more recent year, minus Y1 over year one times by 100. So in this scenario, it would be 300 minus 100 over 100 times by 100, a lot of 100s, which gives you 200% inflation between 1982 and 2017. And that's how we calculate CPI. So now I've given you two ways we measure inflation, the GDP deflator and CPI. And they're both measuring inflation within the United States, but there are two differences that you need to know between the two. The first difference is, CPI is a fixed quantity. This market basket is fixed, it does not change. Versus the GDP deflator has a constantly changing quantity because it's always just how many goods were produced that year. So CPI, fixed quantity, GDP deflator, changing quantity. The second difference is that CPI could be a good produced anywhere in the world as long as it's within the market basket versus the GDP deflator, it could only be goods that are produced here, not in another country, otherwise it doesn't fit into GDP. So CPI, anywhere in the world, GDP just domestic. So they kind of make up for the other one's problems. And speaking of problems, the three problems with CPI that you do need to know, and these three problems end up overstating inflation by about one percentage point a year, which is a lot, considering 2% of inflation is healthy and 5% is unhealthy, is the introduction of new goods that aren't in the market basket. There are goods that we're switching to that are not in the market basket that skew the value of the market basket. The second one, substitute goods. Same idea, we're switching to substitute goods that are cheaper and CPI is just saying, oh, we're buying what's in the market basket. If the prices are higher, they're just higher. Not that we could be switching to a substitute good. And then finally, quality changes. What if there's like a natural disaster for some of the goods in the market basket? CPI says, oh, there must just be inflation. But in reality, what about if it's just a natural disaster calling, causing those price level increases? So quality changes, introduction of new goods, and substitutes are the three reasons why CPI tends to overstate the rate of inflation.